As we'll get started, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Amy Sketch. Uh, she is our wonderful exercise physiologist with our uh, sports program for pediatric endocrinology. <clears throat> uh, Amy did her undergrad and graduate training here at the University of Louisville, uh, so she is a true cardinal. Uh, after she graduated, she dropped down to Tennessee uh, to work at St. Jude. Uh, I believe she was there for four years. Um, where she conducted a lot of research trial looking at neuromuscular uh, conditions uh, and fit physical fitness uh, on uh, cancer survivors. And then we were able to recruit her here uh, last year, and she's been a vital part of our program ever since. So it is my pleasure to, to welcome Amy as she talks about exercise activity and type 1 diabetes. Perfect. Thank you, Amy. All right. Well, thank you everybody for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, first off, I apologize. My voice is probably going to go out halfway through this um, allergy season. Woohoo. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about exercise, activity, and type 1 diabetes um, at our Wendigovec Diabetes Institute and um, the program that we have over there for pediatrics and young adults. So I have no conflicts of interest to disclose for this presentation. And we're going to do a quick overview here. We're going to talk about different forms of exercise, nutrition, different energy systems in the body, and how they can affect um, glucose levels. And then the Christensen Family Sports and Activities Program that we have at the Winnie Novak Diabetes Institute. So there is no one size fits all for exercise. Some people are better for running, some people are better for weightlifting. So we're going to talk about our four main forms of exercise here. So first is our aerobic category, which typically we hear as endurance training. Um, this is mostly factored into uh, help with our cardiorespiratory system. And this is anything that is performed continuously, full body movements for 20 minutes or more. So marathon cycling, running, soccer, basketball, different things like that. Next is anaerobic exercise. This is typically our strength and conditioning type exercises here. Um, and this is anything that is short, powerful movements. So sprinting, again, the weightlifting, um, power training, things like that. Third is our flexibility exercises. The goal for these is obviously to stretch our muscles to improve our flexibility, which helps to reduce shortening of those muscles and reduce injury. And what it, it does that by um, enhancing our range of motion of the muscles in the joints. And then there's stability exercises, and these help to enhance balance, core strength, enhance um, stability around our joints. And the goal for these is to help improve our overall ability to maintain body alignment while resisting unwanted bone and joint movements. So one of the number one reasons for falls is joint instability. So this is really important to incorporate even um, with our day-to-day -day exercises. So now we're gonna talk about, we're gonna, I'm gonna give a broad overview about nutrition, why it's important, and then how it's broken down into energy for our bodies to use. So nutrition and type 1 diabetes, are now nutrition is important for everybody, um, but there's a couple of factors that contribute just for type 1. But in general, nutrition is important for healing, injury prevention, energy maintenance, performance. And then for those diagnosed with diabetes, it's important for blood glucose management. So there are three main macronutrients that nutrition is broken down to, into. Now there's more components to this, but this is what we're going to focus on today. Um, and there's carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. So our carbohydrates are broken down into simple versus complex, but they're our main source of fuel for any activity that we do. Um, they're quick energy, and this is our first, first step in it, um, energy source here. So simple carbs are anything like white bread, gummies, fruit snacks, anything containing sugar. Um, so bananas, watermelon, Gatorade, apple juice. They're things that don't contain the fat, protein, or fiber like our complex carbs do. So again, those contain fiber, protein, or fat, and they're like whole grain products or starchy vegetables like corn peas, potatoes, um, berries with the skin on them, or 
we like to tell our patients to create their own because a lot of them are tired of eating the same thing over and over again. So there's peanut butter crackers, there's peanut butters with apples, um, string cheese with any type of berry, a whole, a whole slew of options there. So how do these affect our blood glucose? Simple carbs cause a rapid rise. Um, and when we have a patient that is hypoglycemic or going hypoglycemic, this is our first step to counteract that. Now they're not in the system for very long, uh, so it's important to follow that up with a complex carb. This causes a, a gradual rise in blood glucose and is our second step in preventing hypoglycemia. Now this stays in our system for a little bit longer and that's because of the protein and the fats that are typically in there and we'll talk about those on our next two slides. So proteins help to build and repair muscle. They are our longer lasting energy source. And the most important thing to remember is that they slow the digestion of carbs. So these are meat, so chicken, beef, pork, fish, eggs, nuts and nut butter, tofu, and that's just the list that we have. There's a whole slew of others out there. Um, and then what do they do to blood sugars? What do they do to blood glucose? They cause a gradual and a low rise because of that slow digestion, but they also help to maintain blood glucose during activity. They prevent those spikes and those lows after activity, and they stay in the system for a little bit longer. So our fats are our stored energy for activity. So anything that we eat, if we don't use that energy during that time, then it gets stored as fat. These are, again, the nuts and the nut butter, olive oil, avocados, flax seeds, chia seeds. Um, and what they do is they don't have a very large rise in blood glucose, but they stay in the system for a long time. So this is the a graph that we give to our patients when they come in. This is in their program handbook, and it is a visual for them. It helps them a lot because they can actually see it on paper. It shows them the macronutrient effect on blood sugar. So simple carbs, again, they cause that rapid rise, which once you get your, once we get their sugar to where we want it to be, if they're hypoglycemic, we'll follow it up with that complex carb so that it sustains that level. Proteins and fats, again, you can see here that they don't cause that large of a rise, but they're very important for pre-exercise, pre-activity snacks or meals to include that in there to elongate um that effect so while performing different exercises our bodies will break down these macronutrients using different energy systems depending on the length of the activity so there's the phosphagen system the anaerobic and the aerobic energy systems and they break down that energy so that we can use that for mus or to move our muscles for that required activity so depending on the type of exercise it will change the energy system we use. So first we're gonna get into how does glucose get into the cell? So the predominant transporters of glucose are um, in our skeletal and cardiac muscle and our adipose cells are GLUT1 and GLUT4 transporters. GLUT1 are our non-insulin -re regulated and GLUT4 are our insulin regulated transporters. So in our resting muscles, when our blood glucose levels are relatively stable, most of the glucose enters the cell th through GLUT1. After meals, when in insulin and glucose are high or during exercise, when insulin levels are low, most of the glucose enters via GLUT4 transporters. So these transporters are activated by both so the GLUT4 is activated by both insulin through our second messenger system, utilizing that calcium um, as well from the muscle contraction. So how does this all work? So the GLUT4 is located intracellularly in vesicles within the cytoplasm. So when they're activated by the insulin, they translocate, or by the calcium, sorry, they translocate to the cell surface and serve as portals through which the glucose enters the cell. The dual stimulation of GLUT4 translocation by insulin and muscle contraction is important because insulin secretion is suppressed during exercise. And this is in our healthy population. Um, this is our non-diagnosed diabetic patients. So when 
total work performed is equal, GLUT4 increases are similar despite differences in exercise intensity and duration. The effect of muscle contraction persists into the early stages of recovery to help rebuild the depleted glycogen stores. So why is this important? Well, for those patients that are diagnosed with diabetes, they have to give their own insulin, right? So they either do it through multiple daily insulin injections or through their pump. But once it's in the body, you can't get it out. So if they give a full insulin bolus prior to exercise and then they go and their muscles are contracting, they're, they're running, they're doing weights, they are still under the influence of that onboard insulin. So that causes more GLUT4 to go to the cell service and pull in more glucose, which results or can possibly result in hypoglycemia either during or after exercise. So these are our energy systems, and we'll talk about how they pull glucose in and utilize that for energy. Now, our phosphagen system is our first system that, that goes into effect. This is really short. It only is there for 8 to 10 seconds max. Um, so this is for like a 100-meter sprint or running from like first to second base in baseball, different things like that. As activity goes on longer than that, we kind of phase into our anaerobic system, which is still not very long. It's about one to two minutes. And this is for like 400 meter swimmers or track, different um, shorter duration exercises. And then as we phase into our next one, this is our aerobic system. This provides unlimited amount of energy. So our phosphagen and our anaerobic system don't require oxygen, but our aerobic system does, which is why we're able to get some more energy from that. So this slide shows each of the phases, each of the different energy systems. So let me get this to pull up here. So this section here looks at our phosphagen system and how ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate, and creatine phosphate react together and the ADP pulls the phosphate from the creatine phosphate and you get results of creatine and ATP. ATP is what our body uses and what our muscles use to create those contractions. So this is, this is that first phase. This is why one ATP per creatine phosphate is not gonna sustain us for a long period of time. That's why it is only supposed to last for about eight to 10 seconds. Our anaerobic mechanism, which um, can either be through like, can enter at the end, it can either enter into glycolysis or go into the lactic acid formation. So, oops, sorry, I misspoke there. Can, can cause lactic acid formation or move into our aerobic cellular respiration. So, glucose broken down, it goes through glyco glycolysis in the cytosol and it produces two ATP or pyruvic acid, which can then enter aerobic respiration in the mitochondria or can turn into lactic acid and be released into the blood. So this, even though it's two is more than one, um, it is still not enough to sustain muscle contraction over a longer period of time. So then we'll look at our aerobic cellular respiration, which utilizes oxygen. It takes the pyruvic acid that was uh, created during our anaerobic mechanism from our previous little square here. It goes through aerobic respiration in the mitochondria, breaks it all down, and we get, depending on if glucose or glycogen is broken down, we get either 36 or 38 ATP. This is a significant increase from the two ATP we got from our anaerobic system, and that's why we're able to use that for a longer period of time. There we go. So how does this all kind of tie together? So depending on the exercise that we do, it depends on the, the mechanism that we'll use to get glucose into the body. And so looking at the different exercises, the type of exercise that is utilized can affect blood glucose differently. So in general, our aerobic exercise decreases blood glucose, our anaerobic exercise increases blood glucose, and then a combination of the two, like in HIIT training, which is high-intensity interval training, kind of stabilizes 
our sugars there. So why does this happen? Well, aerobic activity decreases the blood glucose because as blood glu our blood sugars can enter the cell without the help of that insulin because of that muscle contraction. It allows the sugar to enter the cell, leaving the bloodstream to be used for energy, which leads to those blood glucose, those lower blood glucose levels. Our anaerobic activity increases because to help with exercise intensity, because it's such a shorter duration, our body breaks down the stored sugars, which then enter the bloodstream to be used for energy, which are then leading to those higher, higher levels there. And then a combo of the two because of the highs from one and the lows from the other, they stabilize. So when you're looking at this chart here, this graph, our aerobic, there's two arrows for each of these. And that is because these are just trends. So for this study, they found um, sugars anywhere between these two arrows and these trends. So why was that? It was because the trends are very dependent upon an individual's response to a number of different factors, including the duration and intensity of the activity, what their initial uh, blood sugar concentration was, what their individual fitness level was, the concentration of insulin, glucagon, and any other counter-regulatory hormones at the beginning, and then their nutritional status. So looking back at all of that, pulling all of that together, there's a lot of potential challenges for involving exercise for those with type 1 uh, diabetes. And can, this shows five main categories. So the type of exercise, intensity, duration, timing, training status, um, our environment, so whether it's hot or cold, bodily concerns like nutritional status and hydration, the regimen changes, so that is just dependent on where you start, um, food intake, different things like that, and then hypoglycemia-associated autonomic failure. So having a well-balanced diet and understanding of how activity and nutrition work together can ultimately change the way an athlete with diabetes participates in sports and activity. So this is why our Christians and Family Sports and Activities Program at the Wendy Novak Diabetes Institute is a very valuable asset to our patients. So what is our program? So our program opened in 2018 as part of the Wendy Novak Diabetes Center, which is now Institute. Um, it's a clinical program with an optional research component. It's composed of three phases and two appointments, and I'll dive into each of those in a little bit. But just in general, phase one is fitness testing. They'll come in with me and we'll do about an hour and a half's worth of tests. Um, and then phase two is just the data collection. So they'll fill out food journals, questionnaires, and they'll bring those back to their phase three appointment, which is where they'll have an education appointment with our registered dietitian and our diabetes educators. So we want to, to measure physical function and glucose response to exercise. But the main goal of this program and what we want our patients to get out of this is we want to increase safety and improve physical performance. We want them to be able to go out, participate in their sports, and excel at it. So phase one is the fitness testing, and that's where they'll come in with me. They'll meet with me for that hour-long appointment or hour-and-a-half-long appointment. We look at glycemic variability, body composition, cardiopulmonary fitness, strength, anaerobic power, motor proficiency, resting metabolism, and then we also include flexibility in there. So glycemic variability. These measurements are taken, we take blood glucose and blood lactate measurements at the beginning of their appointment and at the end of their appointment. We also monitor it during their cardiopulmonary test. We want to watch how their sugars are trending over that period of time to make sure one, that they're safe while they're exercising, but to get a better idea of what they need help with um, and how we can help them prevent lows or highs during and after activity. We do take additional measurements as needed. So if they start to complain of headaches or nausea, we'll check to see if their blood sugars are high, if they are feeling low or their CGM, their continuous glucose monitors, going off we'll check it then just to check for accuracy and make sure that everything is safe and good to go so 
Uh, we also measure body composition. We primarily focus on body fat percentage, but we also can look at lean body mass, skeletal muscle mass, total body water. Um, pretty much this is our, our printout. This is a printout, so anything that's on that sheet, which is kind of small, um, but it breaks everything down so we can see it. This is measured through bioelectrical impedance analysis performed on the InBody 770. So this is also a photo of what we have over in our uh, sports lab across the way. So how does it work? We have the patient take off their socks and shoes. They stand with their feet, and it's about shoulder width apart, um, but they'll stand with their feet shoulder, shoulder width apart on those metal placements. And they are instructed to pick up those handles so they detach from the machine and stand with their arms straight out at their side. There's the metal, you can see the metal foot, there's metal thumb, and then around the back side of that is another metal grip for their fingers. And what it does is it sends a very small electrical impulse between all of those electrodes. So it's not felt by the patient, they can't feel this little impulse but the machine times how long it takes for that impulse to get from their left foot to their left hand or their right foot to their right hand it takes it through a circuit so we we look at let me start over so how this works it measures that time because with fat it takes longer to get from point a to point b there's not a lot of water in fat well electricity um likes water it likes it flows faster through water so our muscles are composed of mostly water and so that circuit if there there's more muscle mass it will move faster through the circuit if there's more fat mass it will move slower now if a patient is dehydrated that can can cause a little bit of a stand of an error there um but what's really nice about this is it also tells us if they're dehydrated so we can tell if there's going to be a little bit of fluctuation there. So next is our cardiopulmonary fitness test. We primarily focus on their VO2 max for this, which is essentially how efficient their body is at getting oxygen to the muscles during activity. So we hook them up to that fun little mask that's in that photo. This was her, her favorite photo that was taken that day. Um, so she's got her headpiece that holds the mouthpiece in there. It kind of looks like a scuba mask. And connected to that mask is a hose. The hose goes from the mask to our metabolic cart. It's analyzed by our metabolic cart. And it gives us a couple of different things. So it gives us a VO2 max. It gives us respiratory exchange ratio. So whether they're burning more fat or carbs or a combination of the, the two of them, um, it looks at their respiratory rate. And it does this by seeing how much oxygen they breathe in and CO2 that they're breathing out. So this is all done while they're performing exercise on that, that treadmill. So they do their standard Bruce protocol, which is typically done um, in like cardiac labs. But what they do is they start off at a nice slow walk. So it's like a 1.7 mile per hour walk and a 10% incline. And every three minutes, it gets taller and faster. So it goes up 2% incline and either 0.8 or 0.9 miles per hour. And they are told to go until they can't anymore. So sometimes they stop when it's still a fast walk. Sometimes they stop when they are sprinting up that hill. The goal is, again, to get them to go for as long as they can. The longer the test, the better results that we'll get, the more accurate results that we'll get. But it is all based off of their their fitness levels. So next is our strength, our anaerobic power and flexibility. We utilize grip strength to measure um, body strength. Grip strength has been shown to give a good representation of an individual's general body strength. So for this one, this is the same um, dyna hand grip dynamometer that we use across the way in our lab. And what they're told to do is to hold their arm, their upper arm straight at their side and then bend their elbow at a 90 degree angle. They're told to squeeze that handle for as long as they can and as hard as they can. Now we don't make them go for as long as they can. We give them three to five seconds. Once we see that needle stabilize, then we'll stop them. 
um, they can't feel the handle move, but it does measure the amount of pressure that they're able to put on that handle. So we measure it in kilograms, but it also gives it in pounds. For our vertical jump, this is a measure of our anaerobic power. So the higher the jump, the more power that they can produce. We measure this by having them stand underneath our vertex, which is the pole with all the pegs on it. We have them stand underneath the vertex, put their dominant arm straight up in the air, and we put the very last peg by the, on top of the tips of their fingers. Then we have them do a counter movement jump, so they're standing directly underneath it. They do, they stand with their feet shoulder width apart, squat down using their arms. They jump as high as they can. They get anywhere from two to four trials to do this. And we take what their reach height was and we subtract it from their jump height and or how high they jumped and that's their jump height. And then again, the higher they jump, the more anaerobic power they can produce. And then for flexibility, we'd use sit and reach. This is just the gold standard for a flexibility measure. We do it almost identical to what she's doing in this photo, except we have them take their shoes off so that we don't get the, the error from the height of their shoes. So this is a uniform measurement. It's real easy um, and it's quick. So we have them sit with their feet flat against the inside of the box, their legs straight, and we tell them it's just like you're gonna stretch to touch your toes. So we have them put one hand on top of the other and they have to push. There's a small little plate on the top that you can kind of see here, but they're instructed to push that plate for as far as they can. So next is our motor proficiency testing. This is, so this, we, we look at our fine and our gross motor skills for anybody between the ages of four and 21 years. This is a very large gap, um, but I'll go into how we measure that in just a second. So we utilize the burning Sosoretsky test of motor proficiency, the second edition. I will refer to this as either motor proficiency testing or the bot two for the rest of the presentation. But again, it looks at the fine and the gross motor skills for four to 21. So how do we, how do we do that? Well, it gives us, we take their raw score. So whatever they got during the test, give it and match it up to their point score. So, and then we add up their point score. That gives us their composite. Now, the bot two has already done a lot of studies looking at how can we standardize this across the board. So they have a booklet that talk, that goes through different ages based off of um, puberty level and, and things like that to take into like height, weight, all that stuff into account. So, the younger ages are broken down into three month increments. The, the teenagers are anywhere from six months to a year. So it'll say like 14.6 to um, 15, or they're broken down into like years. And what we do is we take their composite score, we find their age, we match that with we go down and find their composite score underneath their age and it matches up to a standard score and a percentile rank across the board. So that's how we're able to, to compare the force to the 21s. Um, but this test has eight different categories, eight different subtests, and it looks at fine motor precision, fine motor integration, manual dexterity, bilateral coordination, balance, running speed and agility, upper limb coordination and strength. There's a full form which each of those categories will have anywhere from five to eight tests with it. We do the short form. Some of the younger kids have a hard time with doing the longer form because it does take an hour or so to do. So we do the, the short form, which takes one to two tests from each of these categories, and we'll add it up and utilize those. Final test here is our resting metabolic rate. So they get this fun little bubble over their head. It measures, it sends the air that they're breathing through the tube into the same computer we utilize for the cardiopulmonary test. And it measures the CO2 and the oxygen and tells us how many calories per day their, their body requires to sustain itself. So if they sat and did nothing all day long for their age, their height, their weight, and gender, 
how many calories do they need to not gain or lose any weight and keep their body functioning. It can also tell us when they're at rest, if they're burning primarily fat, carbs, or a combination of both. And this comes in handy because typically we ask that they come fasted, usually because they are diagnosed with type 1. We want them to eat so that they do not go low during physical activity so we can see just how rested they are. So jumping into our phase two, this is our data collection phase. This is where they give us food journals and they fill out this uh, sport and activity questionnaire. So the food journals, they have three different sheets that we ask them to fill out. Ideally, we would have a game day, a practice day, and an off day. Sometimes it works like that, sometimes it doesn't. So we also try and tell them that if they can get like a weekday and a weekend day, that's ideal because school food and school lunches are obviously different than what you're going to have on the weekend. So these give our dietitian and our educator a lot of information about how they're fueling before, during, and after exercise. The sport and activity questionnaire, we ask, it's, it's double-sided. This is only the front page here that's up on the screen. And we ask them what their goals are, what sport they were playing, how long they were playing it, how long they were actually active during that game or that practice. Um, and we want to look at their blood glucose management before, during, and after. We also ideally would like them to pair this with one of the days that they do the, for the food journal so we can kind of match them up and see what changes and adjustments can be made. So phase three is that education appointment. They will bring all of that paperwork that they collected in phase two with them. This appointment usually takes anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes. It's more of a conversation with our educator and our dietitian. They talk about the data that was collected in phase one and phase two, and they have an in-depth discussion about their blood glucose management during activity. So they talk about if they have issues with highs, lows, if they're not getting enough protein and fat prior to, what can they do to adjust that? What are they currently eating that they can either add or subtract from their meals? And we don't give them a, hey, I want you to eat this for breakfast. I want you to eat this for lunch. I want you to eat this for dinner dietary plan. And we're not going to tell them what you can and can't have. We're just going to make suggestions on things that you can alter in between there. Now, we... Like I said, we don't give that dietary plan, but we do give personalized workout plans if that's something that they're interested in. So that they will also get that during their education appointment. So they'll come in, I'll go over and talk to them. And based off of the information that they gave me at their fitness appointment and the testing, the results of their testing, I'll make them a workout plan based off of if they want to do it at home, they want to do it at the gym, a combination of both. I don't train them. They're not getting trained from this, but they can take this information with them to either a trainer of their choice or to the gym, or they can just do this on their own at home. And it also helps to teach them how to come up with these workout plans on their own. So the main study that comes out of this is our effects of sports and activities or sorry, our effects of sports and activity program on health outcomes and in individuals with diabetes mellitus. So our aims for this, the primary goal that we want to see is we want to improve glycemic control of individuals with diabetes participating in physical activity. We also want to explore acute glucose responses during the fitness testing, and then we want to explore patient-initiated contact regarding their diabetes management um, with the educators while participating in this program. To be eligible, they need to be anywhere between the ages of 6 and 26 years of age, diagnosed with diabetes mellitus, a current patient at Norton Children's Endocrinology and the Wendy Novak Diabetes Institute, and they need to be able to perform physical fitness testing on appropriate equipment. So our recent research output, this data was looked at, um, I believe I pulled it last Thursday. So we've actually have more participants now than we, than are accounted for here. Um, so this looks at, we have 58 participants enrolled in our research study at the time. We had 60 that had completed the program. 
they either came without a parent and couldn't consent or they opted out because they just didn't want their their information shared with everybody. So you can see we have a wide range of ages from 6 to 24, duration of diagnosis anywhere. Now, this is in years. Um, anywhere from brand new onset, which we usually see about a month, three weeks, three to four weeks after diagnosis if they decide to come in then, um, all the way up to 17 and a half years. We have a good split of males to females. We have a little bit more male participants than female. And then 100% of our participants right now are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. We do see, we're open to see type 1 and type 2, but just the interest level is primarily with our type 1 patients. So one of the recent studies that we did in the fall looked at the impact of a sports and activities program on a 14-year-old athlete with new onset diabetes. So he came to us at, I think he was right at like the one month mark. And he completed the same sports and activities program testing at both baseline and a three month follow-up. And what we found was a significant increase in body composition, so our body fat percentage, total body water, lean body mass, and skeletal muscle mass. We also found um, increases in BMI, our motor proficiency scores, cardiopulmonary fitness, grip strength, and resting metabolic rate. And then there was a significant decrease in flexibility. We hypothesize that this is because of the weight gain. So it's been shown that as an individual gains weight, their flexibility decreases. So that was our, that's what we were thinking was the, the reason for that. Um, but also what it shows is that the sports and activities program can have an impact, can have a positive impact on an athlete with new onset type one. And that physical activity and nutrition intervention early on can help to improve the health, safety, and overall fitness level of these participants. A second study that we did last fall was between, or was, we looked at the relationship between diagnosis duration, motor proficiency, and physical fitness in youth with type 1 diabetes. This, we looked from ages 6 to 21, and there were 37 participants here. This, again, was anybody between brand new onset up to about 17 and a half years diagnosis. There were about 9% more males than females. And what we found, there were 10 statistically significant relationships. The strength of nine of these relationships were moderate, and one of them was strong. Seven relationships were positive, and three were negative. All of the negative relationships were associated with body fat percentage. So what that means is the higher their body fat percentage, the lower the corresponding value, or vice versa. And our positive relationships were found to be between our diagnosis duration and our BOT2, so our motor proficiency scores, our grip strength and resting metabolic rate, grip strength and our motor proficiency, vertical jump, so that anaerobic power and motor proficiency, anaerobic power and grip strength, our vertical jump, again, so that anaerobic power and our resting metabolic rate, and then anaerobic power and our VO2 max. So diagnosis duration and BOT2 scores was one of our moderate positive correlations. And this showed that even years after diagnosis, motor proficiency continues to improve in youth with type 1 diabetes. And then for our grip strength and our resting metabolic rate, this was the one strong positive correlation that we had. And what this demonstrates is that the more muscular strength, therefore muscle mass, the more calories per day can be utilized for energy or that need to be utilized for energy. This is because the calories that we ingest are utilized for this energy in the muscles, so the more muscle, more energy we need. There we go. Um, and this is one of our final studies that we looked at. This looks at the relationship between fitness, physical activity, hemoglobin A1C, and motor proficiency in adolescents with type 1 diabetes. So this was done. We started collecting the data for all of these studies actually in May of last year, and we analyzed this in January. This is part of a thesis project that was done by one of our student interns. 
Um, the ages for this were anywhere between 11 and 17. And that was chosen to look at just specifically the adolescent range there. And we found five statistically significant relationships, which the strength of all of these were moderate two of those being positive and three of them being negative. And as with our last study, all of the negative correlations, all of the negative relationships were found to be involving body fat percentage. So the higher the, the value, the higher the body fat percentage, the lower the corresponding value appeared to be. And the positive correlations were found to be between grip strengths and the number of push-ups. Now the number of push-ups came from the strength section of the bot two. And then the average active minutes per week and our bot standard score. So grip and the number of push-ups completed, this just gives us um, further proof that grip strength is a reliable measurement of overall body strength because as grip strength increased, the number of push-ups also increased. And then active minutes per week and bot two scores show that the more active an individual, the more motor proficient they are, the more fit that they are and physically active they are. So the completion of these studies would not have been possible without our amazing team over at the Wendy Novak Diabetes Institute and Norton Children's Research Institute affiliated with the University of Louisville School of Medicine. So big thanks to our endocrinologists, nutritionists, and diabetes educators, research nurse coordinators, and our student research assistants. And then there is today's event code. Any questions? <laughs> what is the timeline between your like each phase of uh, the program? Like you do your first one and you do like all the tests and then you go with your journal. What's the timeline between that first one in your journal and then your phase three? Anywhere between two and three weeks is what we try to aim for. Some people can't get in in that two or three weeks, um, but that's on our our ideal range there. So, and with the testing that we do, that's. Yeah. So exercise physiologists are specially trained to do some of these tests. Um, so you'd have to have somebody who's specifically trained to do that. So we utilize all of it, but you don't have to. You can do it based off of asking them what sports they play. Um, how active they are, their body composition, um, and then kind of just go from there based off of if they're a beginner, if they've ever exercised before, if they've exercised in the past but haven't done it in a while, or if they're already exercising and they just want more improvement. So you can build a program off of all of those things. You just get a better fit knowing exactly what's going on because some people will tell you that they exercise on their own um, when they walk around at work and that's it. So it's based off of fact versus trusting what your patient says. There's a question in the chat box. All right. So the question in the chat box says, did you find any diabetic complications in those with A1C higher than 8.5? Does your sports and activities program reverse diabetic complications? So we are still looking into that. This program was kind of shut down during COVID. Um, so we didn't get it back up and running until May. But we it doesn't really reverse any diabetic complications. It just gives people the tools to help decrease them.
Yeah, so um, we personally have not looked at that. Those are some factors that can cause some some standards of error, obviously, with, with that information. Um, but typically, that's just like the average with the research that's out there is that usually one corresponds with the other, but there's always factors like what are they training? What are they doing to improve that? Sorry, I don't know if that answered your question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, another thing set in the chat box is that there are well-established metabolic differences by race. One third of residents of Jefferson County are black. It would be of interest to broaden the racial distribution in your program. Yes, so we are looking at that just primarily with the type 1 diagnosis. It's mostly Caucasian that we see in our clinic, um, but that is one of our goals is to try and to recruit more. Yes, yeah, so the program is open to type one or type two, just there's not a lot of type two interest in the program. We've had a couple sign up, but not show up, and then one that did, but they didn't want to participate in the research portion of it. Any other questions? 